Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the homelessness me, um, week. week. 
Hi, welcome to everyone out there, and I'd like to acknowledge the land on which we meet, the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'd like to pay respects to the elders, past, present, and future, and welcome to all of you out there who are watching, and everyone, our panel here, and thank you, and have a great night. Thank you, my sister. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to you from home. Welcome to an amazing evening. Uh, we're going to have uh, a time of questions and answers and interactions with you at home. We really appreciate that you've taken the time. I hope you're sitting down with your family. I hope this can spark lots of really helpful conversations. Uh, as you guys think about not only the lockdown that you're in, but also thinking about how others are going through this time. Particularly, I'm John Owen, I'm the pastor and the CEO of Wayside Chapel, and I extend a warm welcome to you. I'd like to introduce to you my highly esteemed panellists. My brother here, Joshua Peachy, is from uh, Dubbo, a Wiradjuri man, and my sister, Lainey McLaughlin, she, McLaughlin, she is uh, from Armidale, a proud no. Wiradjuri no. woman. Hey, Can Amble. All right, there we go. And uh, a, a Wiradjuri woman. And my brother here, Leon Hill, who is, and I said Townsville earlier, but that's not where he's from. I was thinking about the Cowboys game later on, uh, from Rockhampton. Uh, welcome to you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're looking forward to getting on with it. So, um, look. Half of the country's in lockdown again. My family in Victoria were texting me not only a few hours ago saying, wow, well, it's nice to be out of lockdown, and then just a couple of minutes ago saying, wow, well, we're back in a seven-day lockdown. We are riding the waves of this pandemic. And so more than half the country is currently in lockdown. And we're all going through tough times. And so I just want to acknowledge and thank you for logging on and uh, getting out of the everyday routine, because most evenings, every day can feel a bit like Groundhog Day when you're in a hard lockdown. So um, thank you and appreciate you logging in. Look, obviously it's changed the face of what we do at Wayside, because Wayside has always prided itself on being the place of welcome and place being the operative word. So through this last year and also now, we've had to adapt the ways we do it. How do we stay safe from infection but keep on making those connections? You know, how do we choose courage over fear? How do we choose to love? Particularly now with everyone feeling so down as we enter you know, the next lockdown and the next one and the one after that, with so much uncertainty and insecurity, how can we be a source of good news and hope in what can be oftentimes a very difficult world to live in? So um, this is Homelessness Week, and I really am honoured to be able to facilitate a bit of this discussion and looking forward to getting uh, your feedback and your questions later on. So please message them through, send them through uh, via that Facebook link that you're on and later on in the evening we'll ask some of those questions. The unique thing about Wayside is we're not going to talk about homelessness as an abstract issue, but we're going to talk about it, uh, we're going to hear about it from brothers and sisters whom we walk together with in community. So I really thank you and uh, thank you in advance for your understanding, uh, particularly as we um, uh, talk to brothers and sisters here who, for whom that they know what it's like to be on the streets, and, and I really respect your knowledge here and your wisdom, and we, um, yeah, we res and we, we will hold you guys in the highest regard. And uh, I've already given them permission to tell me, John, I'm not going to answer that question, and I'm, I'm sure we're all in a room full of friends. Here. <laughs> um, Wayside's a bit of a unique place. Even though I am the boss, they got no problems telling me to shut up, and uh, I really appreciate that <laughs> as well. Uh, so, as I said, please start messaging some of your questions through. I understand we have uh, uh, some members from Bronte Public School and a couple of schools around the area. Love to get your questions through as well as you sit there with mum and dad. But <clears throat> let's start with our first question. And uh, Lani's already run away, which is fine, because I want to uh, ask Leon first. Um, Leon, if you could share with us, can you tell us about when you became homeless, homeless and, and what was that like? I was about 25 when I came out. I made a choice to come out because I didn't want my family to tell me what I could do. I wanted to be my own man, experience right for myself. So I decided to come homeless and it was hard, but I travelled around. 
It was good. I made a lot of people. Yeah, very few people. And I come to Sydney, I come to Wayside. And yeah, they're doing very good. Yeah, thank you. So, well, well, where do I begin? I was homeless from the age of five. Um, I started running away from harm because of domestic violence. Um, I never went to school because I was picked on. Um, my, I was adopted and my adopted mother ended up beating me up every day. And I didn't like her in the end. And so I thought, well, the only place I could be safe was on the streets. And once I hit the streets, I felt happy, I felt safe, and I felt like I will make new friends out on the street, and then I ended up um, just living my life on my own, isolating on my own, doing my own thing, and I've been doing that for the last, uh, I was doing that for 20 odd years, and yeah, it became to a stage where um, I didn't know who to <coughs> who to turn to, excuse me, who to turn to, and how to get help. Because when you're only a young five-year-old and you've got your parents uh, really don't believe in you, they don't want you really being an Aboriginal child, only child, um, and hearing them talk about you behind your back. It was like, well, I don't belong in this household, so the only place I went is on the streets. So I became homeless from the age of five, sleeping in the schoolyards, sleeping in people's house, um, our front doors, and sleeping at the primary schools and kindergartens, having the police try to find me, and end up saying that, getting the nickname Black Magic because. Um, I was there one minute and disappeared the next and they could never find me. And they put me on a missing persons list and I thought, well, at least I'm getting some sort of acknowledgement. And the only people that really cared about me was the street people and that's where I became my home for the rest of my life until I actually found somewhere that I could trust, people I could trust which was the street people and being on the streets is the only place that um, you really feel belong, you feel like you belong. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Josh. Josh. Uh, yeah, I became homeless at the age of 13. Um, probably similar reasons to Lee. Um, domestic violence, sexual abuse, um, you know, uh, it was the time that my uncle was so disabled from my mum's brother um, and I have a scary moment around people that drink red wine so I can't be around people that drink red wine you know because um, that's a trigger for me it's a really big trigger but sometimes um, you know you sort of feel that you can't um, be yourself around your family because they judge you or you know, things like that. So um, growing up around the Central Station, hanging around King's Cross from a very young age and then just really um, not finding my full potential that um, that I sort of looking at now yeah, and things that I'm good at. So uh, tell us a bit about uh, now, uh, tell us about your current living situation and how did that so come about? Last year I was offered a property in Waterloo, so I was homeless at the from the age of 13, so 25 years I was on the streets. Um, last year there, there was a really good um, worker, the Bo who used to work here, who now works for Cousin New South Wales. Yes. Um, she became my caseworker as soon as she went, went there and she she supported me a lot through getting, trying to get a property. Um, I had to do a lot of work 
to be able to do that prove to them that it wasn't, you know, the person that's had it, maybe had it properly before and not being able to maintain it and stuff like that. But she seen a belief in me to say, well, no, let's actually give him another chance. And now I live in Glebe. Um, I'm in a really good good spot. I've got um, a lot of support around me now where before there was never that what I call aftercare for people. Um, once you become home when you once you've come off the street in, into a property, there was no one to come and support you behind, like why you're not a, on the street like on the street you can get support from places like Wayside or Nimai or St Vincent's Paul or whatever. But the system it's still broken, but there's that support network there. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing. And well, any of one of the flash battles from the inner west there, mate? Go to right Sydney City area. Sydney, 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 Sydney. Sydney. I'm on the border of Forest Lodge and Glebe, so Marnie, <laughs> <laughs> tell us a bit about where you're living now and how did that come to be? Well from like only um, I ended up getting a place in um, um, Glebe and uh, one bedroom after being on the streets for so long. Um, from um, me and mine, who got me the place with um, women's housing, which was only temporary. And I was pretty happy with that. But the only problem with that was it ended up being because I had my dog on with me at that time, and I ended up getting a choice either have my job or I have to uh, uh, um, leave the property because the owners didn't like dogs in the property. And so I said to um, Nimai, the worker that I was with, that I didn't want to, I'll leave the place if, and I'm not giving up my dog. So they got me a transfer in about three weeks later to Redford and that was a two bedroom place and my daughter came with me and she ended up having a look at the place with me and as soon as I seen it I was so excited it had a bar so I jumped in the bar and said I'll take the place and she just laughed and like it was on nine it was nine balls up and I was out on the balcony I'm going hey this is the best view this is better than the streets and then I thought about it and then I ended up in a relationship with friends and that with a guy from here and that ended up in just domestic violence and so I ended up having to leave transfer out of there because I was scared of my life and so I now am in um, Darling Harbour and I'm like in a one bedroom and even though I'm in a one bedroom I still have I still remember the day of this when I was only young and I came to Wayside and Wayside helped me out so much and they were my support everything because I was alone and I was afraid and I didn't know which way was up or down and it was making it really hard for me mentally because I didn't know how to cope with um, having a house and I was like even now I've got my place and I'm, all my animals and that I'm really happy but I still think of I still wish at times I was on the streets because when you're on the streets for so long you think that's the only thing you know and even I come to Wayside because I like to be around people. I like to um, people to make people smile, make them happy. And now I'm I'm semi happy, but because of the lockdown, I'm just really getting um, mentally. I'm stressed because I'm just so afraid of um, what's going to be next and watching the TV and. I think at times, well, I always can go to Wayside and I've got my friends and workers at Wayside 
and my, they my family. And if we dare come up here, I'm happy. It makes me happy. And when I go home, I have a giggle to myself and go, don't you ever give up this place. You work so hard for it. And I'm so proud of everything that's happened. And I love my community and everything and people around me. So yeah, it's, I love being where I am. But at times I just, because there's no communication with anyone in my place. My neighbours don't talk to me. And the only way I can cope at times I think about, oh, how do I get through this time of the lockdown and everything. And I, then I think about, I'm going to go for a drive around the block. And see and talk to nature <coughs> and go see all my friends at Wayside. And I have so much respect for this place because if it wasn't from Wayside to help me, I don't know where I would be right now. Thank you. Leon, can you tell me what's it what's the first night like when you've been on the streets for a while and you the first day you get your key to the new place? What's what's that like? What if we were in the house? How about it? Back in for a couple of days. First day I went out, I forgot my keys in the house. <laughs> because I'm so used to living on the streets. But you think it's just another person's friend's house, so you just walk out. The rocks used to come and do it, get me in. Yeah. So where, where are you now? I'm at Manabana, not far from the beach. Mm. It's just crazy and that, it's um, pretty good that I can just walk to the beach yeah. and walk around, which is nice and good. And how did you go, how did you get out of the place? Well, a lot of the streets come away so and they got me in contact with a couple of people, with a worker, and um, wife for the house. A couple of months later, I put the house in um, jail, but I got I don't know where he went, so I come to Wayside and they like, contact the person and help us through to get the house. Yeah. Josh, um, Lani's disappeared for now. <laughs> <It's like, laughs> um, yeah. Tell us about uh, the impact of COVID and the lockdown experience has had. Yeah, yeah, mate. Yeah, it's been very difficult. Um, yeah, you know, it's one thing to have mental health and being able to lock yourself away when you feel down and out, but being told to lock yourself away, it's like telling the kid not to touch something, it doesn't matter. How many times you tell them not to touch it, they're going to touch it, you know? Um, and I think just, because um, I'm an extrovert and I have to be around people a bit like Lani, you know, um, if I don't have that sort of human contact or whatever, I. I just go into this little shell and you know, then the whole the whole mindset of the not that we might mention off that I hear voices or anything, but some things start popping up or maybe it's messy if you die so you don't have to put up the COVID or you know, maybe some you know, all these things happen and I guess without without um, going too far out of the spectrum, it's like Sometimes it feels easier to not be around why you've got these things going on, you know, like we went through SARS virus like 10, 15 years ago, you know, and like we, we weren't in this big pandemic that we are in now. And it's like this is just, you know, come on top of us all of a sudden and it's a whole new feeling. It's like, you know, I felt like with the last lockdown there was a lot more support um, out there for people. Um, this time it feels like the support's so few and far between um, that you know it's it's only it's good that like he place likewise so like we we can have our, our air bridge team and actually go out and have have a bit of communication with people to be able to see how how we're going and what support we may need or things like that. Thank you. Uh, Leo, what's, uh, what does Wayside mean to you, my friend? 
very helpful. Right? Mm -hmm. They help me out with very much. But I was on the streets, I come and have a feed, and come up and have these things. I paint me very happy. I work do something. Instead of being on the streets, little we'll drugs or alcohol, you know? Instead of drinking, come have a feed, you know, huh? And I look out there, you need to uh, help with legal aid or something. Just ask some of the people who work on my side, and I'll put you on to someone to legal aid or something, you know? So they're very helpful. Very helpful, yeah? And um, when I first come in before Cobra, I remember going out and a picnic on the beach or something and barbecue. Yeah, they all and that's good. Beach. And that gets people from off the streets not doing the same thing and showing them other things that you can do. Mm -hmm. right? And it's just been very helpful. Yeah, thank you. And I'd like to, like to do that. Right? I'd like to see that more people do things. But there's COVID coming up. Yeah, on the other side of this, there'll be lots more of that. Oh, my God, Bowler, actually. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know, I know. Gary was asking me about Bowler all the time. Yeah, Bowler. Uh, Lani, here's a question for you. What's good about the streets being on the streets and what's not good about being on the streets? Well, I'll start off with what's good about being on the streets. Being on the streets is you have that people connection and you make new friends. And you learn the hard way what to do and what not to do. And what was the other one? What's bad about the street? And what's bad about being on the streets is you watch all your friends that you've grown up with suddenly end up passing away mm -hmm. because of drugs and you're not there to help them because they don't want to ask for help even though um, you might be their best friend. They're afraid of being judged by you or you might call the police on them or something else. And I found out um, coming to Wayside that there's no judgment whether you're on drugs, alcohol or whatever, they accept you, but being, when you're out on the streets, it's like, it's a whole different world. It's like, um, putting it nicely, dog eat dog world, and you've got to survive the best way you can. Yeah, that's one of the things I found, like, you know, the stigmatism of homelessness, in a way, you know, like, Society go, oh, he's homeless or she's homeless, she's either a junkie or she's an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Like, they don't see the sexual assaults, the domestic violence, the mental health issues, other reasons why people actually have to sleep on the street. Yeah, there are people who choose to be homeless, you know what I mean? But there's also people that are forced into it. And it's like, you just don't know where, where you fit in with society. Like, and you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. I recently heard someone say, you know, we so often walk past people and, and the, the first thing that pops into my mind, into people's minds is, what did you do to be on the streets? Instead, we should be thinking more, what has happened to you that this has happened? Yeah, and, and actually come, come together and have a conversation and don't judge me because I'm sitting there asking foolish things. Actually come and ask why I'm looking for foolish change or or why I'm sleeping rough, you know, come and have a conversation. I guess, you know, with things like Long Walk Home coming up, you know, that's what we try and talk about. We try and have that conversation yeah. along the way about, okay, so what can I do, or what can my family do to help a homeless person? You know, it's not always about giving them money or giving them a fee. It's about having a connection and just going and have a chat and say, hey, how are you? Because Sometimes you don't know what a small or high hell he does. And stop looking at the book and reading the page. Stop and talk to us. Yeah. Yeah, because mm. yeah, we're all here and we don't... You're not going to know anything about the homeless people unless you talk to them about the point of view. A lot of homeless people have a lot of problems with right? that. It's not easy to live on the streets. Mm. Right? Some of the nights you can sleep with your eye open. Yeah. Yeah. 
very careful. Like people don't seem to realize. Yeah. They you sit down and sit down and jump with us. Why don't you sit down and talk to us? And we'll explain how, you know, and I'm glad you've got this, because we can express it something to you, yeah? Thank you. Thanks so much, sir. And so, you know, some simple tips there, you know, just uh, stop judging and have a chat. Beautiful. Because you get a better surprise. Thank you. Yes. It's yes. a very good surprise. Thank you, brother. Right. Money, what does community mean to you, though? Community means um, being connected to um, your mob, being connected to Wayside, being connected to the services that are out there, and getting the support that you need and having that having that big family around you and having the respect that comes with being homeless and that. Because it be, having that this having having um being being part of the community means a lot to me because I need that connection with people. I need to um, know that everyone is part of everyone's part of society, and being part of society is a, means a lot to every human being. Because if you're not part of something, then you feel like there's nothing to really um, be part of. And I love being part of this community because all my friends are here, my family, this is my family now. This community of King's Cross is my family. Everyone I've met throughout my years here, this is my community and everyone is welcome to this community with open arms. And I love being here. Thank you. Why is it just like another family to the street people? Yeah. yeah. You know what? Why is it? It's like a family on all the streets. At least you've got a place to come in. Have a friend, have a bar, get dressed, and get clothes. Yeah. And there's no judging it's either. There's, yes. there's no us or them. I like it. It's like a family that doesn't judge you. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, yeah. family. I mean, you do, you do good work, you know. You need to sit down and help homeless people. There's not many people that can do this kind of work that you're doing. But you, we get a lot of many people here, you know. Mm. I've seen it, you know. But you run it real nice and smooth. Because so, you don't judge people. So I've got one thing to say. People out there, if you know someone that's homeless and is, it, is lonely, Come and join our community at Wayside because we're a bunch of fun-loving people and we love to see everyone happy and we just might be able to help you and don't be alone out there. Come to Wayside Community and be part of our family. Thank you. Now we're going to take some questions from people at home. They've already started sending them through. Please keep sending them through. And if you could add your name, I could say, oh, Jenny for, um, asked this. And uh, if you're brave enough, tell us, you know, maybe Jenny from Newtown, who's 20, or Sally, who's six years old. We'd love to know that stuff, but not compulsory. But let's start. Uh, Josh, uh, thinking about when you were uh, on the streets, what's, uh, what small acts can people do to help? Um, yeah, as I said, and I think a few words said tonight, it's about having conversation, having, having, um, maybe having a bit of a reality check with yourself and not judge, but look, from the judgment side, but actually come and, you know, um, sit down and have a conversation, you know, um, even, even if that leads to friendship or, or whatever, you know, because sometimes you, I found over the years that um, I've, in the amount of years I've been at Wayside, so I've been part of, part of Wayside for 25, 25 years, on and off, but I've found some of the most loving people 
because of the conversations I've had about why I'm hopeless or why I'm that way, so you know. And sometimes that's one of the main things that homeless people want. They just want conversation. Yeah. They, um, even if that's giving them a blanket or buying them a hot chocolate or something like that, you know, or two o'clock in the morning before you get drunk, you give them some money or whatever, you know. Um, it's happened to me plenty of times. Um, but yeah, it's, I guess it's about connect, just connecting and going, hi, how are you? And, you know, what can I do for you? Or uh, how, how, how can we as a family or, or a community work with you better to get you off the street? You know? Thanks. Leon, I've got a question here. Yeah, it's from Laura, 18 years old, from Coffs Harbour. Uh, if you had 10 minutes with the Prime Minister, uh, what would you tell him about homelessness and what's one thing the Prime Minister could do about it? Well, why don't you get his ass, stop being in there, take off the clothes, and come spend 10 weeks on the street with his money, his wallet, everything at home, kids, everything, live on the streets by himself and see if he can do it. That's good. Yeah. I bet you he fucking can't do it. If he asked an ass how these people, if he asked an ass how these people, where you get a feeling, where you get a feeling, that's what. He's sitting in the office trying to run the government, mate. Yeah, yeah. That, you're speaking the truth there, but I appreciate that. I bet you three oh. days you'll be back home. Yeah. Um, uh, Lani, this is from Debbie uh, Moliana. Great answer, thanks, <laughs> Um Debbie Moliana has asked, uh, are you afraid of being attacked when you were sleeping on the streets and not having a safe place to sleep? Yes, I was, Denny. I was very afraid of being attacked. But that's where you've got to use your instincts and your brain. And me being on the streets for so many years, I learned who's who and don't talk to... Like, your parents always say, don't talk to strangers. Well, that's where you don't, you've got to learn. If you don't talk to somebody, you never know if you're going to be okay. That person could be okay. You're taking that risk, and no matter what. So, yeah, I was afraid of sleeping on the streets, but what I did, so I wouldn't be afraid at night, I stayed awake all night and walked the streets and hung around a crowd of people and stayed under the lights, day where the cameras are, or stay around people who I knew, and then I wouldn't be so afraid. But if you're on your own out here, like a lot of people are, they don't know who's out there. These days, there's a lot of people out there that are sickos and I think I was very lucky that I never got attacked because a lot of my friends on the street ended up being murdered from, um, unfortunately, crazy people. And I lost a lot of friends through that and I was found out the place that I was sleeping during the day is where they were dumping bodies. Mm. And it scared me, so I ended up finding another place and that ended up being up here at the cross. And I used to walk around all night and then stay awake all, uh, sleep half and half during the day. And yeah, it is very scary. I was scared of being attacked, even during the day. All right, we've got a couple more questions. Uh, Simon Jordan. Hey, Simon. Uh, question for the panel. Maybe start with you, Josh. Can you tell us what you love about the place? Yeah. Um, Apart from me. Right. <laughs> Listen, just because I'm not going to be loyal, all right? Um, stop being blue. Uh, okay, anyway, um, yeah, um, basically, um, yeah, like, you know, you can come here being annoyed and angry and upset, pissed off, whatever, but there's no condemnation against it. There's no judgment on that, you know. Um, there's no conditions that you have to be happy when you come to Wayside. Um, you know, what I love is that we, we're, sort of, we're one big so-called happy family. Um, 
we but we are like nine times out of ten there's more happiness than what there is end of, you know. Um, and that you know, especially um, then black fellow, you know, um, even having a space to come and connect for ourselves and just when you need some cultural connection, um, because you you doing dealing with stuff, um, where you wouldn't probably get that anywhere else, you know, so there's, there's places that, there's a place that you can come to and be loved and not, not judged and you're valued and stuff like that. Thank you, Corey. Beautiful answer. Sis? What was the question? What do you love about Wayside? Well, where do I start? We'll keep it to a minute, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, where do I start? Well, Wayside has that group of special workers and volunteers here that are always having a smile on their face mm. when you come through that door. And we have activities here, we have our um, we have our staff and volunteers that we're not afraid to ask them and they like they always there to, with a smile and I love coming here because it gives me that sense of somewhere I belong, of I belong here and this is my home and it's going to be the, my home for the rest of my life until I die and I love it, all my staff that work, I say my staff because I've been here longer than all of them, except for Chantel. <laughs> and yes. yeah, and it's a community, it's the wayside is the only place in the whole of the world that has a community that can connect and people that understand you, you can walk through the door and you can be on drugs, you can be out drunk, you can be um, mentally upset and they just ask you, is there anything we can do for you to help you? Mm. With those open arms and loving um, smiles that they got. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to have another wayside, anything like this, Wayside's one of the kind, and if you ever in Sydney, if, wherever you may be, come down when COVID's over and check us out because this is a one in a million places that have the community where we do everything. And if you can't get help, I'm sure they try their hardest to ask get help for you and especially Sundays, they're the finest. <laughs> Thank you so much for that answer. It's a great answer. I really do appreciate that. Um, I, uh, now just a question for you there, Leon brother. In the middle of winter when it's the coldest, how do you survive? You know people, they start what your blankets. You get blankets in that go look for places where it's warm. Out of the wind today. I always put a couple of blankets underneath, underneath your cardboard, so you don't get the cold out or anything. Always try to stay warm, keep a couple of blankets with you, and get away from the wind. Have a flag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, sometimes you, you've got to drink a, a flag to fall asleep and you get warm. Oh, yeah. I was drunk every day, every night, so I wouldn't have a clue it was a hot, cold warm. I was always drunk. Great, that's a good answer. Appreciate that. But now I've sobered up mm. and I sleep on the streets and it was very cold. But mm. you got to look. Yeah. 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 Make sure you find a. So if you're going to go on the alleyways and that and warm spots, mm. you make sure you're safe. Yeah. Because if you don't feel safe, go on the streets where there's cameras and that. Yeah, to protect you all the time. Yeah. If you don't have any ways of that, look for real warm places, make sure it's safe. Got to learn how to sleep with one eye open, eh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah for me.
And I, I, I hope you heard before when Lani was sharing as well, volunteers are such an essential part of what Wayside's about yeah. and, and getting the blankets and the support and the love. Um, thank you for those questions, Virginia. Tara, originally from Glebe, Balmain, now Grafton, has lived in a refuge, but not rough. I have a little money to offer, but I always offer a smile. And a question, Josh, maybe I'll ask you, is sometimes, is it tough when once you're in stable accommodation in terms of being used to moving around when you want to, is it a tough transition to make sometimes? Oh, yeah, very much so. Um, and that's why I said earlier, you know, before there was a lot of, the, the system let a lot of people down, you know. Um, where there's like, there's times where you, you when you've got a property, mm -hmm. um, You've got no up. There's no aftercare. There's, there's no support after you get into a place. You know, it's like okay, well now you've got a house. You're not part of the system anymore. You can just look up. Well, you're still part of the system um, from a public housing point of view because you've got a the thing. Okay, well, technically, I'm still at risk of homelessness because if I don't pay my rent or I, I have an argument with my neighbours or whatever, um, you know, uh, you can be kicked out. So now that there's some services available to have that aftercare, have that support once you've moved into a place, and, you know, they can help you niggle out uh, or iron out some of the creases that you, that you find in, in public housing. Yeah. Thank you, bro. And one thing we do is when we do get out, they stay with you for a couple of months just to make sure you've settled in properly and that. Yeah. You know, which, which is good. Yeah. yeah. I know our outreach teams have been going to visit yeah. people in their houses to help. Yeah. That yeah. street transition can be really yeah. difficult. It's very frightening for you from the streets that you're out. Mm. You know, you're in a closed up area when you're on the streets in an open area. Yeah. You have know, TV. <laughs> hey, here's a, here's a question, I'll, I'll throw it to you um, from here, is someone who has, um, Helen says she's a nurse in an emergency department, how can we as healthcare workers help when homeless people present to the hospital? I can answer that one, because I go to the hospital a lot, I go to the clinic a lot for my mental health and other things. And the only problem, the only thing is the staff are really, really busy and they find it really hard to, there are, they need the contact for homelessness or they need to have that special um, person who can understand one on one where that person's coming from that's homeless, who is homeless. And without being judged, because people intend to judge homeless people without realising what their situation is. And if they had more training and more, if they had more people who were able to say, connect with the homeless, like you've got your um, mental health team out there, but that's not enough. That there's only a limited time that you can help someone. What, especially during COVID now, it makes it very, very hard for people to want, get help because they're also cut down in staffing. But when lockdown's over, I'm hoping that the services out there need more training on people connection. and how to understand mental health problems and not be, not judge us or anyone who is homeless, but get that training so they can move forward and get those people into the right areas that they need to be in. Thank you for that answer. Liam, any final thoughts before we wrap up? Yeah, what was that question? What was the question? Oh, that question was, you know, what more can uh, healthcare workers do when people who are rough sleepers present an accident and emergency and uh, um, they need more 
work is short because they are not well on staff and they're too busy reading a textbook to help people. Why don't you get out with the people who have the people there and see what see what's like to be like one of us. Yeah. Yeah? Don't go to you read a book, a book. To show you what to do for home. A book is nothing. Go out and see it. Read for yourself what it's like. Stop reading the textbook. Go out and see like it. Preach it, preach it. Preach it. You'll, get, you'll get more experience, more knowledge of what how to do it if you go and do it instead of reading the book. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Beachy, any final thoughts before we wrap up? Yeah. Um, I think one thing with the um, that last question also is that yeah, like you know, trying to find more more ways to refer people into things so like, like homeless health. So St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney has a really good homeless health program, you know, and you know they do outreach clinics here at Wayside and across across um, Sydney, but also connecting with places like Kirkton Road Centre, you know, and um, trying to you know find out how how better off how they can be better off helping. People that are less fortunate, because not everyone goes there because they they've got a mental health issue or they've got something going on. They've actually got, um, you know, there's probably a, it's a safe space for them to go to because they're around people. You also want to help us? Come to Wayside, buy a nice piece, nice and fresh, and it's cheap, and the money you give them, they buy things that support the homeless people. So it's there you go. I've got one more thing to say. I've got one more thing to say. Please remember, we're in lockdown and the homeless need help getting their jabs. The more people that get their jabs out there, the sooner we're going to be reopening Wayside. So please, we're all in this together. So please, go and get your jabs so we can be a community and be reopen Wayside and have our family back. And thank you for joining us. Beautiful way to end. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. So many questions. Thank you for joining us for the first ever Voices from the Streets. We really do appreciate all your love and your questions. As you can see, there are so many ways, things we can do. There are systemic, there are political, there are health level things. But there are also many ways we can get involved at a personal level, at a personal response, about walking in people's shoes, about connecting, about conversations, about sharing meals over and conversations. So uh, I hope that's given you a lot to talk about in your families and in your households tonight. And we can't wait to do another one of these. I think we're going to have to do another one. Yeah. yeah. So many questions that come through. Thank, thank you, so much, panelists. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Brother Leon. And thank, thank you, everyone, for joining us out there. And Good thank you. Good night. See you. Good night.